This pointed question, which concludes Bill McKibben's Cuba diet, illuminates a core problem with our food system, scale. When we look towards the industrialized and chemically heavy agriculture of the United States, it's hard not to notice the massive yields that are pulled from the soil every day. And it's equally hard to imagine a system that could possibly replace such a large operation. Although local food systems lead to stronger and more sustainable connections to food and community, is it really possible for a mosaic of small food markets or systems to support a country like the United States? To answer that question, let's dive into an agricultural model that has been largely isolated from global trade patterns, chemical inputs, and fossil fuels for over four decades. Cuba. Cuba is truly a unique case in agriculture because it's existed outside of the global system for so long. Up until the collapse of the Soviet Union, Cuba mainly grew sugar and traded exclusively with the Soviets for staples such as rice, wheat, tractors, and gas. But the system was dramatically upended in 1991 when the Soviet Union unraveled and the US maintained its trade embargo on Cuba. The country was left isolated from oil, staple foods, and mechanized farming systems like tractors that were a cornerstone of their farms. As a result, Cuba entered what was deemed the Special Period. Journalist and author Bill McKibben writes that in 1989, the average Cuban was eating about 3,000 calories per day. By 1992, however, that number plummeted to 1,900 calories per day. In short, Cuba was starving because their semi-industrialized agricultural system was ripped out from under them. They no longer had access to the machines or chemicals that allowed them to produce and trade sugar on a large and global scale. So they turned inward, reanalyzing agriculture not as a global endeavor, but as a national and local pursuit. In essence, Cubans, out of necessity, transformed their food system into a network of thousands of small rural farms and urban market gardens that used organic principles to heal rather than destroy their landscape. Here's where it gets interesting. This rapid transition from a fossil fuel dependent and monoculture based system to a diversified food culture is a key lesson to take away from Cuba's special period. McKibben shares that in the 1980s, Cuba had more tractors per hectare than California. But by the 2000s, tractors were quickly replaced by over 400,000 oxen teams. Monocultures were replanted into polycultures. Crop diversity was valued for its ability to decrease pest pressure and encourage healthy soil. Fossil fuel-reliant techniques were replaced with sustainable and permaculture-oriented systems. Organoponicos, or the Cuban term for any urban garden, proliferated widely. Take, for example, Havana. Because small market gardens and urban farms have been allowed to thrive there, the city now produces roughly 90% of its own food. This is in part thanks to the well thought out organic methods of pioneers like Miguel Sassinas, founder, founder of, of Vivero Alamar Farm, 27 acres on Havana's outskirts, a small parcel of land, but one that produces food for 80,000 residents in the surrounding community. But Havana and Cuba in general still needs to import certain foods, especially in times when the island is devastated by hurricanes like in 2008, when it imported nearly 55% of its total food consumption, with meat and vegetable oils among the highest imports in the country. So Cuba's local food system isn't perfect, but it shines in comparison to small-scale food systems in countries like the United States, where most urban and suburban dwellers are hard-pressed to find a local vegetable vendor close to them, but could walk a mile in either direction and likely find a handful of fast food restaurants. What then can regional food systems in a place like the United States learn from Cuba's transition to organically focused agriculture? Cuba's case is admittedly fairly unique. Their agricultural transformation was out of necessity. Cuba's one-party political system made such a drastic transition swifter because the decision to reinvent their food system was unilateral. Cuba's government encouraged and supported national universities that matriculated hundreds of thousands of bright minds 
specializing in soil fertility and natural pest prevention. In essence, Cuba's agricultural processes were able to change quickly because they were in crisis and their governing body threw its weight behind a small-scale organic revolution. Despite the differences between Cuba and the United States, Cuba's agricultural system has promising applications for possible local transitions in industrialized countries like the United States. It demonstrates that a successful, sustainable agricultural model should function within and for a local community, focus on biologically intensive farming on small acreage, and rely on a web of farmers rather than a couple of large-scale operations. Cuba may not be able to grow everything, but it shows the power of small, diverse, and intensive farms. When applied to the United States, this means leaning into endeavors like backyard farms and community-supported agriculture just two practices among many that help build local food systems. The ultimate goal of this is to develop strong relationships between community, farmers, and the food we put in our mouths. Thank you so much for watching. Videos like these take a lot of time to make, so if you like what you just saw, please click the subscribe button or head on over to my Patreon page and become a patron of this channel. Otherwise, I will see you next time.